taking goat shit and turning it into healing medicine. It sounds like some kind of crazy alchemy, but it also sounds like a great metaphor for clowning. This is just one of the hilarious stories I heard from my guest this week, real-life trickster and advocate of unlearning, Manish Jain. Welcome to the Clown Spirit Podcast. And here's your clowntastic host, Mr. Barnaby King. Welcome to this episode of the Clown Spirit Podcast, which is a Clown Plus episode. That means it's an interview with somebody who is related to the field of clowning, but not necessarily directly from it. It's an opportunity for us to weave new connections between clowning and other fields of practice and knowledge. This is really vital for two reasons. First, at the level of ideas, cross-fertilization allows us to grow and learn and evolve. It allows us to question our own assumptions as well as letting our ideas affect the assumptions of others. The lens of clowning can actually help sharpen our understanding of many practices in the world that have to do with reimagining our future. But also there's a second reason, which is at, at the level of people, ultimately allowing groups of people who are committed and curious about the same things, even though they might be coming from different angles and calling them different by different names, to come together, join forces, and mutually connect, support, and strengthen one another's lives. What I'm trying to do here is draw out the links to clowning, see where it is already happening, and call it by its name so that we can expand our understanding of, of clown, but also reclaim the practice as essential to our transformation and survival over the next 50 years or so. Last year, I taught an online workshop at a conference called Reimagining Education, which was created by an organization called Ecoversities. Ecoversities uh, is a community of learners reclaiming diverse knowledges, relationships, and imaginations to design new approaches to higher education. And this is a thing that is very close to my heart as a former university academic and as a, as a committed clown practitioner I'm interested in both these things and how clowning can influence and, and benefit higher education or just education in general. One of the founders of this, Ecoversities, is Manish Jain. Manish lives in Udaipur in Rajasthan, northern India, and he works with a movement called Shikshantar, the People's Institute for Rethinking Education and Development. He's been working for the last 20 years, initiating projects around unlearning, sustainable living, and gift culture. He's also the co-founder of the Swaraj University, India's first university dedicated to localization. You're going to find out a lot more about him in this, I think, fascinating interview. I hope you enjoy this interview, this Clown Plus episode with Manish Jain. As always, please give us your feedback in the notes underneath this podcast. Share it with your friends. Let's Spread the clown news far and wide. And here's the episode. Manish, thank you so much for joining us on this Clown Spirit podcast. I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you, Barnaby. Great to be here. Great to be with, with you and all your listeners. I have so many questions for you because you have a lot of connections with what we're trying to do here at Clown Spirit. And one website describes you as a de-educationalist social innovator, public intellectual, writer, speaker, filmmaker, facilitator, urban farmer, coach, slow chef, slow food chef, trekker, cyclist, and clown. That's what we've come to this, this planet for, right? To learn as many things as we can, to experience as many things. The way we've set up all of our work, it gives me a great opportunity to meet many amazing people that can do all kinds of crazy things. I've been blessed in many ways, I think. And the clowning part, we're going to definitely get onto that. But I'd love to begin by just you telling our audience a little bit more about yourself for those who haven't come across you before. Because I know these worlds 
don't necessarily intersect, but I think the clowning community would be, will be fascinated to know more about you. Yeah, I can say basically my life has had two, two major parts of it. The first part was what I, when I said I was kidnapped by the American dream and I was in the U S and I had a very actually deep desire to serve since I was a child, serve the, serve humanity and the planet, but. I was pushed into the rat race, pushed into competing, pushed into trying to prove my self-worth, try, you know, trying to please my parents, all those kinds of things. So I had a very crazy journey in a sense that I started off in my career as an investment banker on Wall Street. I left that after a few years of, of deep disillusionment, and then I thought I would be a professor, so I started to program it. Harvard. And then I left that when I started losing faith in experts and academia. And then I was, I started working with the UN and, and World Bank. I was there for a few years and then started losing faith in the whole development, international development and aid project. So by the time I was 28, I was very disillusioned with the entire system could see through uh, having been in all these supposed places of power, seeing how powerless people were actually at and slaves to this larger industrial military system. I was with a lot of experts and this brilliant speeches. And then you give them two whiskeys at night and they're like, we don't know what the hell to do. We're really not, not what he knows. And so it's really, we're wait, we're depending on you to solve our problems and you guys have no clue. So that was like, a big shocker to me when I was a young person. I had a lot of questions, I think, about the whole, the notions of happiness. What is happiness and why are we living, running after all this shit that we don't need? And that was all contrasted with notions that I had seen when I used to come back to India, to my village of like community and service and humility and so many different things, which are totally entire different worldview about what life is about. And so anyway, so I got disillusioned and I decided to move back to India and I went to my village grandmother and I thought that I was going to be taking care of her. And she actually started this incredible, uh, initiation process for my wife and me and my sister around unlearning. And actually that unlearning was to help us reconnect to our indigenous wisdom and our roots and our, our bodies, our hands, our soils, our ancestors, all kinds of things. And so that was a 10 year long process with her. And I started actually in that process, started realizing that I think my grandmother, uh, and she had never been to school or didn't know reading and writing. When I said, I think she's more intelligent than my Harvard professors. When we start to think about, you know, what is a good life and how to lead, live that good life and not just at level of knowing, but actually at the level of being, I felt that she had far more to offer in trying to understand that and live that than my professors. Yeah. So we said we, my wife and I said, we did our un PhD with our illiterate village grandmother. And, and, and I realized that maybe the most important thing we need to do right now on the planet is unlearn and learn much of the conditioning that we have been at the last 150, 200 years of indoctrination we've had in a worldview, which is really a war on nature, a war on diversity, a war on creativity, even in many ways. Right. So a lot of my work in education has been really to, in the last 25 years has really been to help initiate people in unlearning processes, young people, business leaders, community leaders, things like that. So that's been a lot. And we created an alternative university, which is basically an unlearning university. And part of the reason for that was that when I was, so with my grandmother, my wife, and I decided we weren't going to send our children to school. So we, we decided we would unspool them. I felt that whatever I had up, done up to now in Harvard and the entire academic journey, I didn't really feel that it was very meaningful. Maybe there was a few things, but that would take a few months to probably learn it. One doesn't need to spend 15, 20 years of their lives doing that. And so my daughter is now 22. She's never gone to school, never looked at a textbook, never looked at an exam, but she's been in part of so many beautiful communities and experiences and, and also worked quite a bit. So I'm actually a big believer in child labor also, 
that children should be allowed to do meaningful things in the world. Obviously, the exploitative and violent, nobody should be forced to do that, not children, not adults, but actually being meaningfully involved, helping people out, working, learning how to do practical things in the world. So we really have a strong approach around apprenticeship learning as part of our programs also. And uh, Yeah, beautiful. There's a lot more to cover there. But one of the things that really fascinates me as a teacher myself is learning new ways to teach. And when you spoke about your grandmother inducting you into this world of unlearning, I'm curious, what was her method of teaching? I'm sure she didn't just say, I'm going to teach you something and it's called unlearning. There was something else going on. What was she, what was she actually doing? What did it look like? How did she help? How did she reveal to you something new? What your question reminds me of a very interesting thing that I heard is that the, actually the best guru never teaches you anything. So the entire methodology of teaching is not one that lends itself to unlearning because actually unlearning is about deconditioning, right? But what we can do is have different sets of experiences, which would maybe help us see different patterns or let go of certain things that we've been holding. I think that one example is, let's see. So my grandmother was, one day she had some super dry skin, like eczema. And my mother is a doctor. As soon as she showed me, I'm like, okay, what medicine you want me to go and buy from the pharmacy? And I'll, I'll go and pick it up and, and give it to you. And then she said, no, I don't want any medicine. So that itself was shocking for me at that time because I was like, okay, why just put some medicine in. It'll be fine. And a lot of these allopathic medicines have side effects, so we should really try to not use them. So I was like, okay, what do you want to do then? She's like, okay, go and get me some goat shit. <laughs> and so I was like, what? And this is when I was fresh out of the UN and Harvard and all of that. So I was like, ah, you want me to go and get goat shit? And where do I get that from? And she's like, no, there's some... Neighbors have some goats in, in this, this, there was a slum area near our house. And so I very grudgingly went to get it and I brought it back and she took that and she boiled it with some oil and she applied it to the, her skin. And the next day it was like totally cured. So I was like super shocked. I'm like, whoa, and shit, it was shit, you know, it wasn't like some nice plant ayahuasca or something like that. It was like shit. So. I was like, this is crazy. Another day she's going to bring some cow dung. And I'm like, what? The cow is in India is considered very sacred. So I used to think it was because of milk and ghee, but then because of all these experiences, I started to find out the cow is actually sacred for urine and for cow dung. And even where I'm, where I live, there's a proverb in our local language of Mewardi, which is Jata Pota Wata Rota. There's a brilliant systems thinking proverbs. Wherever there's cow dung, that's where you'll find your bread or your roti. And that means that at every level of soil, compost for the soil, for cooking fuel, for building material, every level cow dung is a very sacred ingredient in that process. So this whole thing of this construct, for example, around hygiene and health, yeah. this small experience started to really shake that for me in very profound ways. The place I live in is considered very uh, backward and underdeveloped and even sickly by the government, which means that the lots of traditional knowledge and culture still is alive here. Manish, there's so much from what you just said that's stimulating more questions and there are concepts here resonating back into the world of clowning for me. Just talking about shit, and the goat shit, the cow dung, for me, any kind of excrement, human or animal, is like a theme that goes back centuries in clowning. The bodily functions, the parts of life that we want to flush away are the ones that clowns like to bring out and play with, sometimes literally in the case of indigenous clowning, and also, of course, metaphorically in the sense of bringing out, making visible and playing with, repurposing all the things about ourselves the ugly, the smelly, the unpleasant. These are things that clowns love to revel in, in the sense in which we find strength and value and power in those things. In this sense of composting them, the way we compost shit in order to fertilize. So it's just a wonderful example that you brought this up. 
And it sounds like your grandmother was really giving you a clown education, that she was a kind of clown or a trickster in training you through that kind of medium. She was, and that was one of, I have found out over time that she was actually, she had tremendous capacity to be playful and make people laugh and relax and build community. So I think she definitely, she had that clown spirit in her for sure. I do hope that you're really enjoying this Clown Spirit podcast interview. My name is Barnaby King. I'm the founder and the director of Clown Spirit. And I hope you won't mind me just taking a moment out of this podcast to very briefly tell you about Clown Spirit Village. This is our innovative and totally unique offering. If you want to bring clowning into your life, if you want to enhance your clowning, we help you do that in many different ways. We have masterclasses once a month with the best clown teachers from around the world. We have a whole library of pre-recorded resources online for you, including three whole clown courses that you can access immediately. We have links, book chapters, videos, websites, resources that you have instant access to. And then perhaps most valuable of all, we have weekly coaching sessions at different times that you can tune in on. They're small group sessions that you can Jump in on at any time and bring your questions, your thoughts, ideas, bring pieces that you're working on to get feedback. You can use these coaching sessions however you want. They're very personal, interactive. You get real artistic, creative, and life coaching out of those sessions. So check out Clown Spirit Village. The link is in the notes below. It's really about nurturing your inner child, your inner creativity, your inner clown, and crucially, it's being part of a clown community that is supportive and nurturing. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to that interview. Out of this cow dung, we started making cow dung soap, which is even more of a <laughs> mess with your mind that you make yeah. soap out of cow dung. But it's one of the most, it has some amazing antiseptic properties and we make a facial out of it as well. Oh, I love it. And then we make cow dung uh, tooth powder as well. It sounds like a joke. Well, it's to mess with, it's an unlearning, they're unlearning, uh, unlearning products. I was at this crazy thing once, this conference, which was really, uh, there was a broad conference in Austria. They were trying to uh, re, you know, imagine a new kind of art education and a new kind of university. And it was getting a little bit dry and boring. And so in the middle of it, I just took out my cow dung soap and I started in the middle of a conference, started putting, giving people facials. So you can imagine. <laughs> that was a clown performance, Manish. I mean, you were l disrupting the dry academic world with literally some kind of crazy shit. If we now learn how to deal with and compost our own shit with, with it would live a pretty happy life. You know? Absolutely. Not just literally composting our own shit, but uh, metaphorically as well. But the shit that we have in our minds and in our hearts. I run an alternative university here called Swaraj University, and we, it's 100% illegal and recognized by the government. But one of the things is we don't give, we don't believe in degrees and diplomas. And so we have a whole campaign called healing ourselves from the diploma disease, but we have a ceremony for each cohort. And then that ceremony, we give each person probably the most important piece of paper they'll receive in their lives, which is each of them gets a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> and, and that with the thought that if we can learn to deal with and compost our own shit, we will generally ha have happier lives. This is the start of that journey to really do that when people are with us. So there's a lot of metaphors around shit and, and being able to really look at it in different ways. It sounds like one of the things you learned from your grandmother was this kind of trickster energy, this willingness to get up and do 
illegal things or unexpected, unconventional things. So tell me more about the purpose of this, because it seems to me like it's trying to, in a way, shock people out of their patterns and their assumptions about the world to make them see things in a different way, but also presumably to actually enact change. And this is one of the things that's always fascinated me and is at the base of my research uh, into clowning is how clowns actually enact change in the world and create waves to make things and people change their behaviors. And that seems to be exactly what's going on here. Although your grandmother wasn't a, a clown per se, she was acting in this way that is extremely resonant with clowning. So tell us a bit, little bit more about your understanding of that relationship between that kind of trickster energy and actual social change. After many years of trying to go in the system and reform the systems and institutions, I realized that they're fundamentally flawed on many levels. Even people who understand how messed up a system is and are working for their institutions and that they don't believe in it, but they're still doing it because they get paid for it. So there's something really very disarming about that. It's like the people who don't even believe in it are doing it. So I felt that we needed to create other ways and a trickster politics, or I've started to understand my own role maybe in the world is, is identified with the trickster. And so how do we construct a trickster politics? I call it, in Hindi, we call it musti yoga, musti yoga. Yoga, musti means playfulness. And this is the, what I call the missing stream of yoga. Because there's all, there's, there's many streams, but this is the one that, that keeps things from getting rigid, from things to getting too over serious, to being able to invite people back into the spirit of paradox, the space of playfulness and, and humor and laughter. So I think this yoga is, is extremely important in, in, in the world today. And the way that we're trying to work on the crisis, the way we're being trained to think about the crisis is all part of the crisis. And so we need to step out of those ways of doing things that we've all been trained and conditioned and to be able to see and create other realities, other possibilities for living. Yes, yes. And it seems to me there's a big element of failure here, willingness to encounter failure, which is another thing that the clown is really good at and teaches us to do. Because if we're going to step out of uh, the, the way that we're already being trained to think about reality, the traditional narratives, we don't really know what's going to happen. Like what, we don't know what we're stepping into. So there's this fear, first of all, stepping into the unknown, and then also high degree of po probability that whatever we try, it's going to fail. Like a lot of what we try is going to fail. It's, we're going to land on our asses or in the shit. And then we have to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off and keep going again, which is, again, a clown-like quality. Now, that's absolutely yeah, spot on. I think that is a failure becomes a friend is part of the spirit, I think. Making mistakes is actually incredibly important to this process of experimentation and yeah and so i think yeah how we're able to dance with it to play with all of that to nowadays the word resilience is was very popular yeah. but i think clouds are inherently resilient in their approach to the world so how do we bring that into the way we're working on things and i think that spirit is missing from a lot of the activist spaces that i've traveled in and been part of and so Wherever I go into those spaces, I'm trying to bring that in there into the, into those spaces and remind that's the period we, these are extremely serious issues and we have to be serious, but at the same time, we have to be light and playful yeah, to the wool. And so holding both is really, is really the way you know, I really, the mission that I'm trying to bring people into that we can hold both together. One of the problems I think with, uh, with clowns, when they get very political is that they become didactic in a way or like too serious, too entrenched in a particular position or idea that they want to communicate. And the, for me, the power of clown is precisely the ambiguity or sort of the ambivalence, the standing on the edge, the liminality and not. Someone had shared this diagram once with me. There's this, uh, one of the networks I'm part of called Art of Hosting. And it was this two overlapping circles of chaos and order. 
And the overlap part, shaded overlap part of these two circles is called the chaotic path. And that's where the most creative, ah. it's the edges of two systems, basically, or two worlds. And that's where the most creative, the most diverse, the most beautiful things can really manifest. And so I looked at that and I was like, yeah, the entire Western institutional paradigm is order and control. So where is the chaos coming from? So the clown, the trickster has to bring the chaos to make it actually work. Otherwise, you're just like yeah. looking at these diagrams and thinking you're walking on the path, but actually you're sitting right dab in the middle of order and control. And so I think that how do we really invite in chaos and not get overwhelmed by it? Um, yeah, is really the is the kind of game, and so the clown can bring that chaos and to shake up things, to disrupt things, and that's all called quote unquote chaotic. But that actually is where the space where many new things can bloom, actually. And so that that's one of the things I'm very interested in: is how do we bring that energy to help? Yeah, to not just keep reproducing business as usual, which is what usually happens. Maybe you could help me out with this, Manish, because uh, on. On the one hand, my my work is to bring clowning to the world, and that's quite radical and not really business as usual. But in so many elements of my life, even despite this commitment to clowning, it's just business as usual, right? In the way that I bring up my kids, the way I do my shopping, the way I travel. How can we disrupt all these patterns? How can we change when we're so addicted to these habits and routines that we have. I feel often really frustrated about that. Yeah. So I think that's the, the reason I'm talking so much about unlearning, you know, I would say there's three levels or four levels, you know, so one is these habits that we follow, the comfort zone. So how do we start to do that, to open up things beyond those patterns and the second dimensions in our own fears. So much of what modernity has created is extreme fear, anxiety, artificial scarcity. And that seems to be the dominant mindset and spirit by which how people make choices in their lives, right? They're governed by that. And then the third di dimension is, as I mentioned, the tools we're using, the way we're going, uh, all of those things as tools, methodologies and and then the fourth is even the definition, things like how we talk about progress and success and happiness and all of these things and development. And I think there's a need to be able to flip some of those and to open up the definition. That's happening, actually. It's very exciting that many movements around the world, and I would call it that clown energy that you can actually, you know, I usually say the people who control the definitions and the indicators control the game. And so as soon as you can start to redefine things, or reorient things, it opens up a different kind of set of possibilities. So even when we're talking about that, we can define what a university is and that university could be full of clowns as faculty and, and uh, the university could be going on pilgrimages with circuses or doing it, whatever you want to say about it, that opens up so much new possibilities and how we've conceptualized or so if we can start to shift these definitions and and open up and play with them right 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 so we're really talking here about shifting who has the power traditionally like on a micro level between individuals but could this also be on a macro level in terms of whole countries bhutan little bhutan is a clown country I mean, that, that, that they're questioning the entire notion of happiness they told the U.S. And, and the West that you guys have all the money and technology and armies, but are your people really happy? If not, then, then what the hell are you guys doing? Why should we follow you? And so I think that that's a, this is a lot of the larger framework. How do we break those patterns? That's why clownversity, I think, is very important because it then is not just about clowning as a theatrical process, but it's actually clowning as healing, clowning as living, clowning as farmings or the food we're eating, clowning as the way we're building community. So all of those things have to become infected almost with the clowning virus in a sense to be able to start to generate other ways out. And what the clownversity could do is actually to create these small invitations to people to start reading that spirit. What does it mean to bring that into your office? What does it mean to bring it into 
your school? <laughs> How does that start to create a different kind of different pattern start to be created in that? Or what does it mean to do that with your family? So these kinds of invitations could be part of it. So I've found that one of the main areas around un unlearning is around money and our relationship with money. And, and that seems to be one of the most critical things If I, I would invite all my clown brothers and sisters to, to say that this is one of the fundamental challenges of our time is how do we, through clowning and this clown spirit, start to shift in our relationships with the money system and the way we're, we've been conditioned to behave around that, the fear and scarcity and all of that. This is a really fascinating topic. I wonder if you could say more about this, like how in practice might we bring a clown spirit to, to start to shift our relationship with money? There's many ways. One thing we do is, for example, a pilgrimage on bicycles for a week. So nobody has any money, no technology, no packaged food with them, no, no medicines with them, and no plan. That's maybe even more diff difficult than having no money, but no plan. And we go and we live with villagers and communities and we just travel. I tried this once in Madison, Wisconsin, actually. A friend invited me to do it for a day, part of an event he was doing. But it's fascinating then what kinds of things can, can emerge in terms of shifting your own reflective power and, and agency around money when you start. And this is kind of a direct, both an unlearning, but an invitation to enter into the gift culture. So I think this is the other element when we're talking about money, then how do we start to think of gift culture, the spirit of care and mutual care and kindness and forgiveness, and how do we meet our needs without destroying the planet, all of that kind of stuff. How do we regenerate the commons? So I think these are questions that we can get into through some of these experiences. And so when people go without money for a week, it really opens up things at very profound levels, I think, for them. Um, Another things we've done is we've had ceremonies where people burn money as part of the ceremony and to say that they're not going to, they don't want their lives to be dictated by the money system. That's so these right. are all trickster kinds of things and we can start to, to bring more energy into these kinds of exercises and activities and processes to really open up new things within people. Everything is actually there. It's all, a lot of it is being suppressed and being yeah. silent or being fear of humiliation and so many things. So there, if there's a little bit of space for it to start flowing again, all kinds of magic can happen. If clowns and people who do clowning can have a goal, maybe it's that they can just, with their clowning, open up a little bit of space in these kind of locked systems and ways of thinking. Yeah, maybe I can uh, just elaborate briefly on that, Barnaby, is I yeah. think the this shifting from this artificial scarcity to understanding abundance, you know, and if we can open that space of abundance a little bit, abundance or what I even call radical trust. So we have one project, which is in the, which I, we're calling the jail university. It's in the central jail. So how do you reimagine the entire prison, not as a place for punishment, but for a place where people can go to connect to their different, their, their deeper purpose. And so in that, this small thing of getting, once the sense of abundance is created, getting people, the jail authorities, the guards and the inmates, how do we build this space of trust around this together? And if we can, you know, we've been able to do that in ways I can't even describe, but that has opened up so much space. It's almost a miracle. Some of the stuff that I see happening there. And so this space of abundance, if we can just help people tap into it a bit. And the last note I would just say is like these days I've been saying to a lot of people, particularly to young people, we don't need to wait for permission. So I think that the beauty of the cloud is not waiting for permission all the time to do things. They are in a different, they're flowing or beating to a different drum. And so same thing with my university or we're, we're helping to launch hundreds of them around the world or support hundreds of what we're calling eco-versities and, and saying, you know, why do you need permission? Let's just do it. And then, and let's see what happens. So I think that's the beautiful thing is when, when the clown can invite people to stop waiting for permission from the authorities to do it, because they're not going to give us permission to radically reimagine the systems. 
we have. So we need to be playful about claiming that space again. Yeah. This is, yeah. Manish, this has been so great. Thank great. you so much for sharing so much with the, the Clown Spirit audience. And I hope that there, there could be some crossover. I'm sure that many of my audience will want to know more about you and get more involved in your work. And maybe some of your, the people following you and interested in your work will be able to connect with Clown Spirit and the clown world as well. Yeah, I hope so. I'm really excited about this new friendship, Barnaby. I see that, that the clown spirit is going to be a very significant part of creating new worlds and new ways of living on the planet. I appreciate a lot of what you're doing and uh, all of your listeners too. Really my deepest honor for an appreciation for all of you. And let's play together sometime. It'll be yes. beautiful. Yes, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yes. We well, hope to get you to one of the Ecoversity's other, the global gatherings. It'll be great to have you there. So there you have it, Manish Jain, finishing up with this statement that I know we all know very well, but it's wonderful to hear him say it, that clown spirit is going to be a very significant part of creating new worlds and new ways of living on the planet. I really hope you enjoyed listening to Manish's crazy clown ideas today goat shit, cow dung, crazy tricks to grandmothers, burning money, and of course, clown versities. Thanks for listening. Please leave some feedback. Let's spread the clown energy. And of course, as always, keep clowning. <laughs>